Here we are in 1 Kings, am I on here? In 1 Kings chapter 1, and we see the story of Adonijah. Adonijah is David's fourth son. Now I came across this story in, in you know, kind of my, my study and my thought on Father's Day sermons when I was thinking about you know, fathers and their children and the culture. You know, the, the sermon this morning kind of popped this sermon up um, in my mind and in my uh, reading. So what I wanted to look at was um, some things that we could learn from this story. We see this story of Adonijah, which is basically um, a, good, a good lesson for us that good men of God, great men of God, don't necessarily pass that on to the next generation. I mean, here we see Adonijah, which is David's fourth son. You know, this, this kid had some issues. And, you know, it's another son of David's that tries to take the kingdom. All right, so what I want to do this evening is I want to look at Adonijah. I want to look at Adonijah and another son of David. And I want to look at some aspects of what they did and have kind of a cultural application of that, of that, of these men's lives and see what we can learn as a church and as people. Now, you know, both things to watch for, first of all, and things not to do. Okay, and now this is now, first of all, let me just give a disclaimer. This is one of those sermons where you may sit in your seat and go, Oh, is there something wrong? Is something going on? Look, not as far as I know, okay? I mean, this is one of those preventative maintenance sermons, okay? So, I mean, we used to have preventative maintenance programs at power plants on huge, expensive machines, right? We would have, we would implement a preventative maintenance program where we did certain things so these machines would last like four or five times longer than they normally would. So this is a preventative maintenance sermon for the church, okay? And for us, all right? So we can, we can learn some things from these stories. Because look, there's some patterns here that always repeat themselves, okay, in these stories of Adonijah and someone else that we will look at. So let's look at the story first of all. We'll do, we'll do it, we'll look at the story, we'll study out um, what happened here, and then we'll apply that to us individually as a church and how, what we can learn going forward. All right, so we can be more protected, okay? Think about it that way. Look at 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse number 5. The first point I wanna make um, with Adonijah and the pattern that he follows that we will, you will see with this type of person over and over again is that he first, Adonijah, he exalted himself. Okay, look at verse number 5 of 1 Kings chapter 1. The Bible says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he was also a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. So look, this is no nothing new under the sun. This idea that somebody who's, you know, trying to take over and trying to, you know, subvert the leadership would exalt themselves. Turn back to 2 Samuel chapter 15. Because even this very man's brother was no different than him. Okay, his brother did exactly the same thing. So you would have, I mean, you would have thought that after everything that they went through with Absalom, that more people would have noticed. But fortunately, as we'll see as we go through this, the right people did notice, okay? Look at 2 Samuel chapter 15 and verse number one. The Bible says, and it came to pass after this that Absalom prepared him chariots and horses and 50 men to run before him. So it wasn't that somebody took Absalom and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to put you in the high seats and we're going to give you these men. And No, he prepared that for himself, right? He prepared all these men to make himself look special and important. And then the Bible says, and Absalom rose up early. Absalom, of course, is the, the one that successfully took the kingdom from David for a period of time. Okay, he successfully led a coup against his father. All right, and this is the beginning of it. This is how he did it. And the Bible says, And Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. And it was so that when any man had controversy, had a controversy, came to the king for judgment, then Absalom called unto him and said, 
of what city art thou? And he said, Thy servant is one of the tribes of Israel. And Absalom said unto him, See, thy matters are good and right, but there is no man deputed of the king to hear thee. So basically he trashes leadership in a, in a subtle way here. Right? He basically says, oh, here's somebody with a problem that's coming to the king for judgment, and he basically intercepts that person and says, oh man, if only the king could help you. Bummer. You know, there's nobody, right? And then in verse number four, it says, Absalom said, moreover, oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man which hath any suit or cause might come unto me, and I would do him justice. So basically what he's saying is, man, you have a problem? It's too bad that the king can't help you. But if I were the judge, I would help everyone, right? I mean, it's like he's exalting himself. He's, he's lifting himself up. The same as Adonijah. He's lifting himself up. All right? So that's the first aspect we see of what Adonijah did, is he exalted himself. He lifted himself up. The second is this. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 1. 1 Kings chapter 1. And look down at verse number 7. In verse number 7 of 1 Kings chapter 1, the Bible says, And he conferred with Joab, the son of Zariah, and Abi Abiathar, the priest, and they following Adonijah helped him. But, but, Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei and Rhea, the mighty men which belonged, and the mighty men which belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. And Adonijah slew sheep and auction and fat oxen and fat cattle by the stone of Zoheleth, which is by Enrogel, and called his brethren the king's sons, and all the men of Judah the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he called not. Now look, turn to 2 Samuel chapter 15. The, the second aspect that we see of Adonijah is this. He separated people on purpose. Okay, he specifically separated people for strategic advantage. Okay, Absalom did exactly the same thing. Okay, go to 2 Samuel chapter 15 and look at verse number 11. And the Bible says in 2 Samuel 15, this is Absalom. It says, and Absalom went... And with Absalom went 200 men out of Jerusalem that were called. So these are men that he chose. Okay? He chose them. Why did he chose them? And they went in their simplicity, and they knew not anything. So Absalom picked and chose certain men to go with him. All right? And they were, the Bible says that they were you know, chosen for their simplicity. Go back to 1 Kings chapter 1. Let's look at um, verse 10 of... 1 Kings chapter 1, go back to Adonijah. You see, the similarities between these two are shocking, actually. But it's not really that shocking because they were doing, their motives were the same. So they were following the same pattern. And in, second, in 1 Kings chapter 1, in verse 10, the Bible specifically says, But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he called not. And look at verse number 11, and this will tell you you know, basically why he didn't choose them in verse number 11. And it says this, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth not? Look, he separated people and chose certain people so David wouldn't find out. He was separating people in a strategic way so people wouldn't find out and tell David what he was doing. It was very simple. Okay? But look, David did find out. All right? Look at verse number 12. David did find out. And who recognized the issue with, uh, with Adonijah? Look at verse number 12. Now therefore come. This is Nathan the prophet talking to Bathsheba. Even Bathsheba didn't know before Nathan told her. So, I mean, there was some subtlety going on here. The, but the Bible says in verse 12, Nathan tells Bathsheba, he says, Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Because Solomon was promised by David that he would be the king. So Solomon was supposed to be the king. 
And here Adonijah had kind of exalted himself. He wanted to be king. He was forming this little alliance to the side. And he was doing all these things and raising himself up to be king to steal the kingdom from Solomon basically. David was old, he was stricken in years, the Bible says, and he didn't have any idea that any of this was going on, okay? And look at verse 13. And Nathan says, go and get thee unto King David, and say unto him, didst thou not, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Why then does Adonijah reign? So she's basically saying, you better go and tell King David, what's going on about, about what's happening here? Okay, now look, here's some, some words on Nathan here, all right? This guy's been around the block. I mean, this guy has, has seen some things in his time, and he recognizes this right away. Okay, and he goes and he tells Bathsheba, who's the mother of Solomon, David, and one of David's wives, of course, and he basically saves the day in this story. So Nathan saves the day, but look, he had the experience. He, he recognized this pattern. I mean, think of the things that Nathan had seen. I mean, it was easy for him to see when you think about it. Like, hopefully David took good care of Nathan in his life. I mean, Nathan pulled David out of the fire so many times. When you think about it, it was Nathan that went to David after his major sin with Bathsheba. And it was Nathan that, that basically confronted David and said, you know, thou art the man. You know, you are the one. And he brought that sin to David. And of course, David paid, you know, the chastisement. He got chastised by God. But at least David was confronted by Nathan and was able to get right right away. He had the choice to get right right away. So it was Nathan who recognized that and brought it to, to David. Then, you know, Nathan again here. You know, Nathan's not, he, he's not 30 years old here. Nathan's an experienced person. He understands what's happening, and he saved David big time throughout his life. So the conclusion of the story is this. Adonijah, he, of course, you know, his, it's brought to light. He then, you know, he gets, he gets caught, and, you know, Solomon even says, you know, I'll, I'll let him live, right? But then he takes things too far, and he asks to marry, you know, David's concubine, um, which at that point Solomon says, you know, you've obviously not humbled yourself. You're obviously still after power. You're obviously still causing trouble. And he has Benaiah, you know, the hammer. You know, first of all, every leader needs a Benaiah. That's not in the sermon. But I mean, this guy who's just like, hey, he's just dropped, you know, whenever the hammer has to be dropped, Benaiah's like, no problem, I got it. Amen. Right? I mean, he takes care of all these people for Solomon. He's the one that killed Joab. I mean, it's just, then Benaiah went, if Benaiah's coming for you, things have gone south. Okay? One of the mighty men, of course. All right, so here's the story. We see that there's a very specific pattern here. And I got to thinking about this when I was reading this and I was writing the sermon for this morning. And I just want to just bring up some cultural things that we need to watch for. And like I said, this is preventative maintenance. Right? Don't be all, oh. You know, because uh, there's no problems here as far as I know. All right? So let's just look at some application here. What can we take from this? So on this Father's Day, we see some kids here that didn't quite turn out, right? Absalom, Adonijah, they followed a specific pattern, and the pattern rings true today. And you know as I bring these things up, if you can think in your mind things that have happened in churches, you know, not this one, but I mean other churches that you know of, this pattern rings exactly true. So let's step through it. Look, there's nothing new under the sun. Amen. Nothing. So let's learn some preventative maintenance lessons from these kids. The first one is this, okay? You need to beware of people that need to have the preeminence. Okay? And look, don't be this guy. Right? Don't be this guy, number one. But first of all, beware of people that need to have the preeminence. You know, these are your people that are like your one-uppers. Right? I mean, where they've always got the better story, or they've always got this, or whatever. Think about, Ad I mean, think about this kid. Think about Adonijah. Think about him. I mean, what had he done? What in the world had this kid done where he would say in verse number five, I will be king. 
What had he done? Nothing. Think about his dad. Think about David. David was Saul's armor bearer before he killed Goliath. David was anointed by God to be king. And Dave, David's heart, you, you say David, you know, is, is, is got all kinds of problems throughout the Bible, agree. He did all kinds of things that weren't right and all this, but his heart was right towards the Lord. Amen. His heart was right. His flesh messed him up a bunch of times, but his heart was right towards the Lord. Where was Adonijah's heart? His heart was for himself. So you think about just the, the arrogance of this kid, the, the, the preeminence. I mean, he had done nothing, yet his father was this great man of God. So it was, look, it was the same with Absalom. Absalom, oh, that I would be judge in the land. What makes you qualified to judge people? Nothing. I mean, just because, you know, he's the king's son, you know, it, it's, look, you have to watch out for these people that need to have the preeminence. And I'm not saying that every single person that's arrogant and needs to have the preeminence in their life is going to turn out to be this way. That's not what I'm saying. But the people that turn out to be these wicked people that will just rebel against leadership, they, they do it for this reason. Because they need to have the preeminence. Look, good leaders don't need the preeminence. Good leaders lead out of service. They, they lead, I mean, they lead, I mean, a good pastor leads out of service to the Lord. That's why he leads. A good pastor leads because he wants to serve God with his life. That he wants to build people up with his life. That's why you'll, you'll see a good spiritual leader. Because they want to build people up. It has nothing to do with them. It's a matter of fact, it's very detrimental to them. Is, is what you, I mean, can't you, can't you see that with what pastors go through? Can't you see that with what, I mean, it doesn't matter what year it is. If it's 2020, 2019, 2018, 2017, just think of the, the things that pastors have dealt with in their churches with people just like stabbing them in the back and all these different things. I mean, look, a good leader just leads out of service, not out of preeminence. But they're going to have these people that pop up and that need to have the preeminence. That's the first warning sign, that they need to have the preeminence. These are the people that they're always the ones they have to be the most spiritual. Like they speak in Bible verses. Look, no one speaks in Bible verses. That's not normal. You want to, we talk about the Bible. That's good. But no one, you just like this person that's trying to out-spiritualize everybody all the time, that's not, that's not normal. You know, that's, that's a, that should raise a red flag. Okay, these people are trying to build themselves up. All right, here's another um, aspect of this. And, and this is a big one that I really want to focus on um, as far as the culture of, of a church, especially a church our size. All right, I want to focus on this aspect of these two men, these two boys, these two sons of David, in this aspect that they needed to, they were, they were always trying to separate people. They were trying to pick and choose and separate people off. Okay? Now look, let me just rabbit trail this thing for a second. Because look, this is a big deal for us, especially because we're a small church. Okay, look, the importance of unity in our church, I cannot stress enough. Okay? Because look, we're a small church. We need to be careful. And this is something that I didn't really necessarily understand when I would hear pastor preach it when we first moved to California, to Sacramento. But pastor, you know, preached a lot against the formation of small groups. And look, in a bigger church, it's less of an issue. With, with, with a church our size, we do not want small groups forming. Because we, it's, people will feel excluded. And, and we, we need to make sure that we're not doing that. Even if it's innocent. Okay, look, even if it, you're, there's no Adonijahs here. All right, it's just something we need to be conscious about. Right, so look, what I'm getting at is that the culture of our church should be where there's never something where 80% of the people are invited. That should never happen. Because um, people will feel left out. Right, I mean, and you say, man, so I'm going to have like, you know, five or six people over. And look, I, I don't, this has never happened. 
as far as I know. Preventative maintenance, okay? But look, you say, look, there's always going to be in a group of people, there's always going to be people that you connect with better. My wife has a friend and she calls it clickation. I just have clickation with these people. And with this person, I don't have so much clickation, right? I mean, it's true. That's the way we are, right? But especially in a small church like this, we need to make sure that, you know, people are included in, in things that we do, okay? Because we can't leave people out. And you say, well, that seems like, um, it seems like that's a lot of work. Well, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work if you want to go and do something with four people to call an extra four people and make sure that everybody at least had the invite and all that type of stuff. That's a lot of work. But, but guess what? That's church. That's church life. That's, that's life with your brothers and sisters in Christ. This isn't the world. Okay? There's no cool kids here. Okay? We're all cool. All right? But look, there, there's, no, there's none of that here. So it's extra work to go to those steps. But that's a culture that we have to have here. Okay? So, I mean, even though we have a tendency towards that, you just need to think about each other when we're part of a church, right? I mean, go study the one another's in the Bible. In the Bible, You know, there's all these different things like you should consider one another, you should build one another, you should pray for one another, you should give to one another, you should exhort one another, you should forgive one another. I mean, you can have a sermon series on one another's. I mean, it's not you and your buddies. It's not you and me, two people. It's one another when we're part of a church. So that is something that we always need to be conscious about, especially us as a small church. Okay? Preventative maintenance. So it's just different than being part of a normal group of worldly people. It's different because we are going to consider one another. Okay? All right. Now, back to what I was talking about. It takes effort, right, to have a friendly church culture. And by the way, we notice, I mean, look, I can do everything myself and my wife can do everything here ourselves, but look, we notice when there is people here that aren't necessarily comfortable in the church, whether they're not, um, whether they're not like regular attendees or they're not three, you know, three to thrive or whatever, and, and we see that certain people of you are like giving extra effort, look, we, that does not go unnoticed because that's exactly the culture that we want to have here, and that is so appreciated, I can't even begin to tell you. Okay, because look, we can't be everywhere at one time. Okay, my wife is talking to somebody, some visitor today, look, there's other people that need attention in this church, and you guys, you all are taking care of that. And we notice it, that's the culture that we want here. And, and it's happening, and it needs to continue to happen. Okay, all right, go back to 1 Kings um, chapter one, and verse number 45, 49. So look, here's the thing. Back to the story, and like my second point on unity is this. We need to beware of people that are always trying to separate people. Okay? Because you will meet these people that are always trying to separate people. And look, don't be the one doing it. Because look, even if you're, even if you're not, you know, sinister about it, it it's, it's not a good thing. Okay? So look, Look at 1 Kings chapter 1 and verse number 49 where the Bible says, And all the guests that were with Adonijah were afraid and rose up and went every man his way. So look, the people that got separated by Adonijah, they got hurt too. So we don't want to be and we need to be aware of people that are trying to separate people. Okay, because that's what will happen. And I'm telling you, it happens every single time that there's been huge trouble in church. There's been somebody that has separated four people or whatever, and then the trouble starts. But I'm telling you that even though that might have started with one bad person, all those people got hurt. All those people got hurt. And that's what happened here, too, in verse number 49. They were all afraid. They're like, oh, man, oh, this guy's in a lot of trouble. And we were along with him, right? So, I mean, be, I mean, be careful. I mean, recognize it and be careful. If, if you see somebody like that, okay? Because you don't want to get caught up in that, right? These are people that are always trying to, like, get people to talk in a corner or something like this. I mean, that's a huge red flag if that happens, okay? They're trying to separate you. Don't be the simpleton, as in 2 Samuel, okay? And it says that Absalom picked the simple people. 
He picked the simple guys. Don't be that, all right? You know, and then, because look, that leads into all the, I mean, why are you in a separate conversation? It, it, is the, it begs the question, right? Why are, is there always these separate conversations going on? I mean, I mean, that's why I like the big group that we always talk in. I love that. I mean, if, first of all, it's fun. Second of all, I mean, it, it's, it's the way we should always be together. Because, I mean, look, you know, you just have to kind of ask yourself why someone would want to be doing that if that happens. Okay? Because, look, it will stick to you. If, you, if, you, if some Adonijah grabs you, it will stick to you. Okay? And, you know, think about this, too. How is your spirit after hanging out with somebody? Right? You ever, be, you ever been around somebody who's just really negative? I mean, so that's another little litmus test for yourself. If you're hanging around somebody who's always negative, how, how's your spirit after talking with it? Maybe their little red flag comes up. Something's going on. All right? Because, look, that's, that's where, when I think about all the disasters that have happened in the last two or three years or whatever in, in churches that I know of, it, it's always started that way where people got separated and then they started talking about things that they shouldn't talk about and there was like all these secrets going on and all this. I've seen it personally myself up in Sacramento. You know, all these little secrets that, that start going on. Like, and, and here's the thing. Okay, let me go off on this one too. Here's the thing about secrets, okay? And I just dealt with this with somebody in my secular world life, okay? And Americans don't know this anymore. Secrets are always bad. Because look, we, we, were, raised on, we were raised on Survivor. Remember that show? I don't even know. Is it still on? Where this show where everybody would form these alliances and it was all about, you know, stabbing people in the back in the most efficient way. Like, people were raised on that. They think it's okay. They think as far as long as, like, in a work environment, people think that if that gets them ahead, it's okay. So, I mean, I, I, I've told people, like, at my job and people that are, like, in groups and teams of mine and stuff, look, we're never going to tell secrets. Keep things above board all the time. That's how we operate here. Always. Secrets are always bad. I mean, that's a pretty simple rule, right? Because here's the thing with secrets. Number one, you say, well, you know, what do I do about this knowledge that I have? Number one, if it's something that you can't say to certain people, it shouldn't be said. And number two, if it's important, just say it to the person. Just become a man and just say, you know, if I, I don't like the fact that Brother Ryan wears that shirt, I shouldn't go and tell secrets to people about it. I should be like, man, I don't like your shirt. I should at least be a man about it. Man. Right? Your shirt's fine. <laughs> uh, it's the best thing I could come up with in the moment. But look, I mean, people, I mean, it's, it's shocking to me. I mean, I know we know this because we're Christians and we know what the Bible says, but people don't know this. People don't know that they shouldn't be going around like doing all this Scheming. I mean, people, like 50-year-old people. They don't know. It's shocking, but look, secrets are always bad. Secrets bad. I feel like I'm talking to a bunch of little kids sometimes. You know? Not you. But look, the, the, the secrets thing, they, they owe, whenever something like this happens in a church, here's the difference. People forget the God factor. Turn to Luke chapter 8. Here's what people like Adonijah and Absalom, they miss all the time. Every single time. They forget the God factor. Look at Luke chapter 8. Look at verse number 17. And this is true every single time I've seen it. Every time. Amazing how the Bible is right. Luke 8, 17, look what the Bible says. For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. Turn to Luke chapter 12. And look at verse number 3. Luke chapter 12, just a few chapters over. The Bible says, Therefore whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closet shall be proclaimed unto the housetops. Every single time this is true. <laughs> Look, so two things. It should either not be said, or you should just say it to the person that it's about. Just, just do it, right? Because it will always come out for everyone to see. Period. Right? And 
Some people won't see it until it does come out, but there's always going to be the Nathans that see it right away. That's another thing. So look, you will then, if you've been involved in that type of stuff, this is back to the, like, the gossip sermon and things like that, you'll always be lumped in by association by the Nathans. Right? So that's, that's why so many people get hurt in these situations that you've seen because like they were able, these people were able to like separate out all these people and they didn't just, I mean it would be fine if like okay you're just some idiot that, that was spreading new doctrine around a church or you're just some you know arrogant fool who was just trying to rebel against his pastor or whatever, right? But look, they always bring these other people with them. They always take other people down with them. So look, we just have to, we have to recognize that it starts you know, down this road. If, if some, because look, the reason that they separate people away from the crowd is because if, if somebody that was pushing some new doctrine in this church or was pushing like, you know, rebellion against the leadership in this church or something like that, if they would come into the circle that we always have in the back, somebody would just shut them down right away. So they're always going to just like grab some people and try to just plant those seeds of discontent, right? So we just need to be like, look, we just need to be aware of this pattern. It's the same every single time. I'm sure we'll, we'll deal with it here at some point. I'm not really looking forward to it. You know, I want to come and I want to, you know, lead a church and I want to do like the first works and I want to come here. And look, it, it's hard work doing this, right? It's hard work. You know, leading a church, it's hard work, you know, for even you all doing what you're supposed to be doing, coming to church, going soul winning. I mean, it's not the easiest thing in the world at times. Sometimes when you go out soul winning, you know, people are just slamming doors in your face all the time. It seems a little bit like labor. It seems a little bit like labor. So, I mean, we want to just do the work. And I mean, I don't really want to deal with the garbage like that. I'd rather not, but I know that it's going to come. So, I mean, if you all, I mean, that's why we're doing a preventative maintenance sermon. So, if you all could help me recognize things like this, that would be helpful. Amen. Some Benanias, Amen. some Zadok the priests, some Nathans out there, right? So, look, it's just, we can learn a lot from these kids. Okay, it's not a really complicated lesson this evening. We can learn a lot from these kids, both on not doing the things that they did, Right? Because look, it doesn't even have to be like, you don't have to be some sinister person who's trying to take over a church to do things like this that could hurt people's feelings or to, to separate people off or to be, you know, this person who's, I mean, look, because I mean, the last thing you want is some Nathan to like, be like, oh, why is he doing all that stuff? That's weird. And then you don't have any intentions, bad intentions at all. I mean, that could happen too. Right? It's just, we ought to consider one another. And then we won't be separating ourselves. Right? Then we won't be exalting ourselves when we think about one another. And that's, look, it, it's, I'm trying to sell you on this. I'm not trying to sit here and, and I know that as this church grows, that we're going to have more people who become more friends and become all this. And, we, and, and I'm just going to have to keep saying this and keep selling you because the last thing that we want, I mean, think about it. If it's not, there's no sinister plot or anything. Because, I mean, I don't want to be a paranoid person. I refuse to do it, right? And if I would rather think the best of somebody and then just take the knife in the back. That's where I'm at, okay? But look, Say that everyone has the best of intentions, but somebody just ends up getting left out of things all the time or whatever. Look, that's my responsibility. If something like that happens, that's my fault. Because I should be the one watching to make sure that that doesn't happen. Right? That's why I'm preaching a sermon like this. Is there problems? No. I don't want problems. I want uh, two or three guys in this church that are super good buddies, I want them to be good buddies. I want them to hang out and to, to be friends and all this, but I want them to take that extra effort and invite the other four people and include the other four people, even though they may think that those people aren't going to come or whatever. I want the women in this church that get together 
at a park and all these types of things, even though these two women might be just the best of friends and have the super clickation going on to include everybody every time. Because someone will get hurt. And it's a terrible thing to think that you know, you're not included or that they don't, somebody doesn't want you there. That's a terrible thing. So look, that's what I'm always watching for. Okay, and that's the, that's the good side of, you know, unity, right? Is just that somebody could accidentally be left out. The bad side is that it could be something bad, like this, right? And, and every single time, I want you just to think in your mind uh, of the situations that, you've, that, you've, that you remember, because I know you all remember these situations. They were so high profile, they were such messes, and Every single time that this happened, it followed this pattern right here. Every time. Every time. So let's recognize it before it gets crazy. Because look, they brought other people with them. And that, to me, is the tragedy. Right? Because look, I mean, I don't really feel bad for the guys that came and like, like did those things and just... You come into a church and you try to spread some different doctrine and all this. I don't really feel bad for you, and I feel bad for your family a little bit because they're going to suffer with you. But I mean, ultimately, the, the real tragedy of those situations is that they brought other families down with them. Yeah. And, and just like in verse number 49 here, the same thing happened with Adonijah. They were all afraid. They were all afraid. Okay, so let's just watch for these things. We need to have, especially as we're starting, look, we're building a strong base here. We're, putting, we're building a strong foundation here. As this church builds, and as new Christians, new believers come in here, and they get baptized, we now have a baptistry. As you know, they get, come in, and they get baptized, and we just start turning people into disciples, we need to build off a strong foundation. Okay, and that's where we're going to be. They're going to come in here, and they're going to see unity in this church. They're going to come in here and they're going to see a church that's going to include them even though we don't even know them. I mean, I've known some of you now for years. Can I say years? I think I can. I've known some of you for years. But somebody that comes into this church should be just as included as somebody that I've known for years and have good clickation with. Yeah. Right? Yeah. right? That's what we need to be. That's the cult. Am I selling you uh, on the culture that we need to have here? It's effort. It's effort. And we need to have it. Okay? Let's bow our heads uh, and have a word of prayer and then have some root beer floats. All right? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for um, these stories in the Bible. I thank you for um, even the bad stories in the Bible, Lord. You're giving us some patterns that we can watch for, some things that um, we can recognize, Lord, some things that uh, we can just, you know, be aware of. You know, the Bible shows us everything. Um, I pray, God, that you just give us unity in this church and you just give us that, that heart to, to take that effort with our brothers and sisters and just to always have that unity, Lord. And as this church builds and grows, Lord, um, we have this unity so you can allow this church to grow. And uh, we just need to be strong. We need to be tight. And as people come into this church, Lord, just help us never to... Um, exclude people and always bring these new people into the things that we're doing and all of these different things, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this entire day um, and, and for all the fathers um, in this church, Lord. Um, I ask you just to bless this evening and the fellowship to come. In Jesus' name, amen.